Hello, I'm Matt Spangler, Extension Beef Genetics Specialist at the University of Nebraska, and today I'm going to discuss genetic selection tools in beef cattle, in particular EPDs and potential antagonisms that might exist as we try to select for multiple traits that might impact our bottom line. So let's start with the fundamentals. Phenotype is really the sum of genetic effects plus environmental effects. And so if we delve deeper into that, the phenotype, or what we see, is really the cumulative effect of a population average. So you can think of this uh, within a single breed. What's the mean per, for a particular trait? Plus an animal's genetic merit, or their breeding value, uh, plus any environmental effects. So let's compare these two calves. Both weighed 600 pounds at weaning. Those are unadjusted weaning weights. And both come from the same population. So they have the same population mean or same population average of 550. The calf on the top then has a breeding value of plus 10 and an environmental effect of plus 40. Whereas the calf on the bottom has a breeding value of negative 5 and an environmental effect of plus 55. So they got to the exact same winning weight, but they got there in substantially different ways. The calf on the top got there through superior genetics, whereas the calf on the bottom got there through an advantage in environment. And as we choose sires, we have to realize the only advantage a sire passes on to the next generation is through his genetics, not through the environmental benefits he may have been afforded. So it's important to realize that selection on just an animal's phenotype can lead us in the wrong direction. So we learn about parents or sires from their progeny. So in this simple example, a sire produced these five calves across varying contemporary groups. And the calf on the top had a 30 pound advantage at weaning compared to the average of his contemporaries. The next calf had a 15 pound advantage at weaning over the average of his contemporaries. The next calf was actually 10 pounds below average compared to his contemporaries, and so on and so forth. And if we average these, we get an average of a 10 pound advantage for this sire's calves compared to their contemporaries. So that becomes the foundation for an expected progeny difference. Now, we shrink these EPDs uh, according to our degree of belief in them. And that's really associated with the accuracy value that goes along with EPDs. So a high accuracy sire, so an, a proven AI sire, these EPDs wouldn't be shrunk much because we have a very high degree of belief, of belief in these EPDs. But a low accuracy sire... Um, we know there's considerable uncertainty in them, and as a consequence, we shrink them even more. Now, unfortunately, EPDs are specific to a breed, and you cannot directly compare EPDs of different breeds against each other. And the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, or MARC, publishes on an annual basis a crossbreed adjustment factors. And those can, are available at the Beef Improvement Federation website. Uh, that's beefimprovement.org. And you can find these. They're published at the annual uh, research meeting of BIF. Uh, and you can find those published on that website. And I've just listed a handful of breeds here for a handful of traits. But there are more breeds and more traits where these adjustments are available. And these can be used to actually... Uh, adjust EPDs uh, so you can get a fair comparison across breeds. And I'll illustrate, a, illustrate an example of that next. So here we have a Simmental bull that has EPDs for birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, and milk. And we want to compare him to a Hereford bull that has EPDs for the same traits, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, and milk. So from the previous table, we know the adjustment factors for Simmental, so we can take the Simmental bull's actual EPDs and add or subtract from them the adjustments uh, that we found in the previous slide and get those on an Angus base. And we can do the same thing for the Hereford bull. Take his 
actual Hereford EPDs and add or subtract the adjustments from the previous slide, put those on an Angus base. So now we have the Simmental bull and Hereford bull both on an Angus base, and so we can directly compare their genetic merit as sires uh, for these four traits that I have listed here. So this allows us an opportunity to really compare apples to apples. So as we think about selecting sires, uh, it's important to realize what traits may be terminal or maternal in nature. And so I've listed here some traits that I consider of, of importance for terminal sire selection. Calf survival, uh, male fertility, disease susceptibility, calving ease direct, so how easily a, calves, uh, a sire's calves are born, uh, growth rate, feed efficiency, and then of course carcass quality and composition. And the traits I have listed in blue are ones that virtually every breed association has EPDs for. Um, the traits that I have listed uh, in black, some breed associations have EPDs for, and male fertility, the particular one is scrotal circumference. Or the traits that I have listed in red, really we don't have EPDs available for, but uh, these traits are impacted largely by uh, heterosis or from crossbreeding. And here is a list of traits that are of maternal importance. Female fertility, maternal calving ease, so how easily uh, a sire's daughters will give birth. Uh, maintenance energy requirements, largely driven by mature weight and, and lactation potential. Reproductive longevity, maternal weaning weight, again driven by milk disease susceptibility, uh, regional adaptation, and, and temperament. And again, the traits in blue, we have available EPDs for across the majority of breeds. The traits in red, uh, unfortunately, we don't at the current time, although there are ongoing research projects uh, focused on, on these respective traits. So you notice that I have a couple of these highlighted with stars. And so exactly how is milk important? I think this is a, a nice example of a trait where more isn't always better, and this is a study from the early 1990s um, where the investigators looked at separating cows based on low, medium, or high milk production potential and their respective income, expense, and economic efficiency, whether those calves were marketed at weaning or at harvest. And what I want to draw your attention to is the numbers in green, which regardless of the, um, the out output group or, or when those calves were marketed, um, the calves from the, the low milking cows had an economic advantage over the calves from cows that were either moderate or high in terms of lactation potential. So milk production, uh, particularly in environments where feed availability is limited, can be an, uh, a detriment. And we know that because lactation potential comes with an increased cost in terms of nutrient requirements. And even when cows are dry, they actually require more nutrients due to lactation potential because their visceral organ size is larger. So another example of that, um, if we look at uh, the percentage of energy partitioned into individual maintenance uh, in a low feed input environment, uh, a cow with a low production potential, so low uh, potential for milk production, uh, when feed's limited, she has additional resources to, to put into other things, such as fertility. Um, but on the flip side, a cow that, that has a lot of lactation potential really doesn't have any left over uh, to maintain her body condition and to be fertile. So what EPDs or economic index values do we have that focus really on input traits? Angus's dollar energy value uh, certainly focuses on that, concentrates on, on milk EPDs and, and mature size EPDs, and gives producers a feel for which bulls may sire uh, replacement females uh, that may be lower cost. Reduces maintenance energy EPD uses mature weight that's directed for body condition score, also the maintenance component of milk. And here's an example of two bulls that have maintenance energy EPDs, one of a plus 10 and one of a plus zero. 
And from this, we can say that daughters from bull A should require about 10 megacals more per month uh, than those from bull B. Now, megacals per month can admittedly be a bit confusing. So depending on forage quality, that could be anywhere between 11 and 20 pounds of forage per month difference uh, between daughters from bull A and daughters from bull B. So these two tools can be used for producers that really need to get a handle on decreasing input costs in the cow herd. So let's take a look at what we've done through selection for traits like weaning weight. And here you can see the seven largest beef breeds in the U.S. and their genetic trends all put on the same base or the same playing field for weaning weight. And by and large, they've all selected to increase this trait and reasonably so. But unfortunately, we know that weaning weight is genetically correlated to things like mature weight. So here you have the genetic correlations between mature weight and immature traits like birth weight, weaning weight, and yearling weight, they're all moderately correlated. And what this means is if we're selecting to increase yearling weight um, and keep back replacement heifers, there is the potential that over time we're going to increase the, ma the uh, mature weight of our cow herd. And so it's important to keep that in mind so that we don't, so to speak, shoot ourselves in the foot. And then also here I'll highlight this genetic correlation in red between mature weight and hot carcass weight, very strong at 0.8. Um, and so as we select to increase hot carcass weight genetically, uh, we will increase mature cow weight. And so it's important to try to keep mature cow size moderate and use terminal sires uh, where we can get added growth from. And even consider perhaps purchasing replacement females that were designed to be moderate and certainly conservative in terms of lactation potential and then turn out terminal sires on those. We do have several measures of, of reproduction in terms of EPDs. We know that fertility is at least twice as economically relevant as either growth or carcass traits and several breeds publish a heifer pregnancy EPD or a stability which is a really reproductive longevity EPD. And here I have a couple examples of those. Um, the heifer pregnancy example, we see a, a four-point uh, difference between these two bulls, and we can say that daughters from bull A are 4% more likely to become pregnant and have a calf as first calf heifers. Or the longevity, we see a, a six-point difference between these two bulls, and we can say that daughters from bull A are 6% more likely to stay in the herd and be productive until age six. Calving ease most often is thought of as, as calving ease direct. Uh, birth weight is a, a great indicator of calving ease, but it certainly doesn't tell the whole story. And in fact, recent research has shown that birth weight only explains about 40% uh, of the genetic differences between animals in terms of calving ease. So calving ease is most certainly the economically relevant trait. But there are two types of calving ease, calving ease direct and calving ease maternal. And if I'm retaining replacement heifers, what really matters to me um, is how easily those females will give birth themselves, and that's calving ease maternal. And here I've illustrated that uh, the difference in postpartum conception between animals that had no difficulty and those, uh, as I've scored here, is a two, which have a, a little bit of a assistance needed, or those have scored a three, which had a lot of assistance, or even a cesarean, and you can see a dramatic decrease in postpartum conception as we had to apply a lot of assistance. So for those producers uh, keeping replacement females, you need to keep an eye on calving ease maternal as well and realize that there's a slight antagonism between calving ease direct and calving ease maternal. So as we select to uh, improve calving ease direct, we may begin to erode advantages in calving ease maternal. And so it's important to select on both those two EPDs if you're retaining replacement heifers. Probably a lot of you have heard about genomics, and I'm just going to mention that briefly. And there's really three primary applications. One is identifying those animals that uh, are carriers of potential lethal defects. And, and being able to utilize those correctly in our breeding programs. And it doesn't always mean avoiding them. It just means utilizing them correctly and avoiding matings where we have a high probability of having defect calves. 
assigning paternity, which is represented by this human example here, um, determining which sires are actually siring uh, the calves that best fit our breeding objectives. So if we turn out a large cohort group of bulls, um, they're all supposed to be calving ease, but we pull some calves regardless, assigning those problem calves to the, the sire that's actually creating the issue. Or this equation I have here, uh, which is what we use to predict uh, EPDs, actually trying to uh, determine the genetic merit of animals based on genomic information. And the majority of beef cattle breeds now include genomic information into their EPDs, which actually increases the accuracy of those EPDs on yearling bulls. So we can buy yearling bulls um, with the accuracy level as if they'd already sired several calves. And certainly that has an economic advantage to us as commercial producers. So to summarize, again, it's critical to concentrate on traits that are economically relevant to your breeding objective and to understand the differences between different sources of information. EPDs and economic index values are really the currency of the realm. And EPDs are seven to nine times more effective at generating change than selecting on actual measurements alone. And it's critical to stay informed. I encourage you to check out these resources here, beefefficiency.org, which focuses on evolutions in terms of the use of genomics, particularly re related to, to feed intake and feed efficiency. Um, the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium website that has several recorded webinars on, on selection tools. And of course, the University of Nebraska Beef Production website. And uh, relative to EPDs, the NEB Guide 1967 uh, focuses on EPDs and explains them in detail and also lists all available EPDs across all breeds and gives definitions for them. And then if you want uh, additional information, uh, the Beef Home Study Course, Beef Basics 2, um, has a chapter focused on, on genetic selection in beef cattle. Thank you.